Hello everyone, I'm Phil, uh, this is Michaela. We are developers from the Government Digital Service. Um, you might note us for some, uh, and just, can we keep the noise down over there please? Yeah, that's good, right. Uh, you might notice for things such as um, computers that don't respond, uh, it's always the way. There we go, that's how slides go. Okay, you might notice for things such as gov.uk, a uh, show of hands, who knows about this? So there's a, a few people, maybe about a third of the room. Uh, this was us celebrating their third birthday a few months ago. Um, this is what some of us look like. You might also know us for data.gov.uk. Um, who knows about this? Um, a similar number of people. Um, today I'm not going to talk about either of those things. Uh, we are going to talk about what we're working on, which is registers. Um, so to get into that, I'm going to start by saying let's talk about countries. So does this, familiar, does this look familiar to anyone? <laughs> yeah, a few nods. Um, I mean, I pulled this from a data set uh, um, from Companies House. Companies House is a UK organisation that uh, deals with setting up and disbanding companies. Um, and in, the, in that data, there's a field for countries. And this is some of the values that you get for Scotland in that field. And so it's all, you know, there's Scotland and Scotland and things like that. Um, I could have taken it from any number of data sets. I'm not picking on Companies House here. But um, the point here is that friction caused by badly curated data makes it hard to build digital services and do analytical work. And a lot of what the government digital service does is around building digital services. So good data, clean data matters to us. So if we want to fix this, we need to decide what form is correct. To do that, we need a canonical list of valid names. So let's try to find one. So I went on gov.uk and there's uh, a page to apply for visa application fees. And there's a list of countries and territories. And, uh, but then I go to getting married abroad. And here I need to choose um, which country or territory I want to get married in. But it's, it's not actually the same list. Um, there's a PDF of ISO country codes that I found, which has a list, and again, it's a slightly different list, which also seems to think that the internet is a foreign country. <laughs> um, th these lists don't even agree on the number of countries, let alone the right spelling for these countries. But it turns out that one of the lists published on gov.uk was authoritative. One of them was... Um, had weight behind it. It was published by the Foreign and Commonwealth o Office, which is, uh, promotes the United Kingdom's interests overseas, supports our citizens and businesses. Um, they lead on the government's list of approved geographical names. They've been publishing a range of country-related lists on gov.uk for some time. It used to be published like this, which was a page rendered from a CSV file. So you'd always have to remember to check whether or not there was a new version available. Um, the same list was also published by another related group called the Permanent Ge Committee on Geographic Names. So there was another URL for the same data. So there were several versions of the truth. This is what we've built. This is the new country register. Uh, let me see if I can get that away, yeah. Um, it's curated by the FCO, it says right there, provided by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. This is the list of countries according to the UK. There is no other list now. This is the canonical one. You always know you've got the latest information, and I'll show you uh, why that is in a moment. But this is what registers do. So each record in this register is a country. So if you go to this URL at the bottom, this is the record for the Gambia. And Within that record, there are fields for useful things, such as the word you should use to refer to citizens of that country, the official name for that country, and then the official short form, the standard short form for that country. So in this case, we've got the Islamic Republic of the Gambia and the Gambia. Um, there are date fields too, because countries change over time. Uh, the record for East Germany has an end date, and the record for the Federal Republic of Germany has a start date the next day. 
the data is available in different formats because uh, people who consume data have different needs. So here's the record for Germany in JSON format. And here's a bunch of countries available in CSV format. We recognize that different users have different needs. Um, JSON and CSV are two, uh, two, just two that I've shown you, but we also provide YAML, we provide tabs separated values, we provide RDF in the form of Turtle. The country register is being put to use on the e-petition service. Um, another show of hands, has anyone heard of this? Um, it's worth talking about a little bit. The e-petition service is something that any uh, UK res resident or British citizen uh, can sign a petition. Um, and you can see there's a few popular petitions listed here. Um, when you sign a petition, uh, you need to write, tell uh, the, the petition service where you are. Uh, you get asked for your location in a box here. So this um, used to be a hard-coded list that they had within their app somewhere. And now they have a nightly job which loads the latest data from the country's register. And therefore, it will always be up to date. And well, there's some interesting things as well. You can ask me about it afterwards where you can get data about petitions and see signatories by, broken down by country. So the way we have created these registers is by um, talking to lots of people, working out what their needs are, trying to come up with characteristics of what makes a good register. And we've written them down in a blog post. Um, I won't go through all of them, but I've talked about a couple of them that they're live data. Um, uh, um, but I'm going to dig into that a bit more now. Um, it's not a file that gets updated once a year and that uh, gets out of date progressively more and more throughout the year. It's a, it's a service you can go to all the time and see what the latest authoritative uh, information is. So the page for a country here is the latest data. You can also sit and watch for updates. So as new changes come into the register, um, there's a single URL you can go to and see new entries being made. So, uh, um, and you can see all the entries all the way back to the beginning of the register. So in principle, if you wanted to download the whole register, you could just go to the entries page and replay every single entry in order. And this gives you all sorts of other properties too, because not only can you get, um, have a download that you can keep up to date, you can also have a data set that is historically aware and you can say what was true at a given point in time rather than what is true today. Um, when a record gets changed, if a country gets renamed, a new entry is added to the end, but the old entry is still available. Um, so, Phil has described something that already exists. The country register is out there. You can access that. Um, I'm now going to talk to you about the things we want to do next, some of which I can't go into too much detail, and that's because they mainly are still ideas on our wall in the office in post-it notes. Um, so, what's next for registers? Um, well, we want to build more of them at the moment. We have just countries. Um, there are many, many other data sets in government that um, are all held and maintained quite differently. Um, they may already be open, but how accessible are they? Some, if you're a service that needs three of these data sets, one that's only available in CSV, one that's only available as HTML, that's quite difficult. Um, and it's difficult if you have to build bespoke software to access each, uh, access each of these data sets. So we want to be considering more of these as registers so that they're available in a more standardized way. Um, it should help everyone to build better services, cheaper and faster, and across the whole of government. Um, so we started to think about registers for local authorities, schools, and businesses, but this is just the beginning. Hopefully there will be more. Um, Data in individual registers should also link, link to each other. So a data in a register should reference data from another register. This reduces replication, uh, duplication and spaces for error. Um, linking the data is possible because registers use standard names for their fields and standard data types. And each entry 
in the register that you saw earlier has a unique and state stable identifier. An example might be the um, there's a register might be a register for food hygiene ratings uh, of um, if a local authority goes to a restaurant and gives it a rating on how hygienic their food preparation is, we might need a register for that. Um, but they might want to link to uh, the register of companies so that they don't have to maintain their own version of a restaurant company and maintain that twice. So, um, technical standards are definitely something we require to link between the registers. But more importantly, for these links to work, there needs to be trust between the organisations and services that are producing these lists. Um, so for the registrar or authority creating the food hygiene ratings register, they need to be able to trust that data in the uh, register for companies. Otherwise, they won't want to use it and they'll duplicate it. Um, so, yes. So... Uh, Trusting a register means that you must be able to trust that the list will be kept up to date, as Phil discussed earlier. Um, it's not going to disappear and it's not going to change shape either. Um, we must also be able to trust that the authority we said created that list genuinely did create it and that what they said this data means is what it means. Um, so what we want to do now is build a layer of proof what we're calling proof mechanisms on top of our registers. Um, so I'm now going to describe three of these proofs um, that we think there's a need for. Um, each of these proofs will sort of allow us to verify a certain property of a register. So the first of those is what we call an audit proof. It allows us to verify that a single entry in the register generally does come from that register, so it was created by the Food Standards Agency, for example, um, and that um, if someone has given me an entry from a register, um, I can prove that that hasn't been tampered with, that it genuinely is that certain that that copy. Um, you should then be able to take this entry that someone has given to you and give it to someone else, and they should be able to prove that that is a genuine entry in the register and that they can trust what you are saying. Um, for example, here's a picture of the window of my local pub. Um, the sticker on the right is what um, a food hygiene rating might look like in the UK. So this is telling me as a customer that my local pub restaurant has a food hygiene rating of five out of five, according to our local authority, according to the Food Standards Agency. But when I look at that, how do I know that that's specific to that restaurant. There's nothing specific on that sticker to that restaurant. They could have actually bought this on eBay because that is, has been possible at one point. Um, but what if the food hygiene rating sticker looked more like this? So it's specific to whatever the restaurant is. Um, there's a machine readable fingerprint on it that allows someone, a potential customer for a restaurant, to be able to say, to check that and say, okay, that genuinely did come from the Food Standards Agency. It's not just what my restaurant wants me to think they have. Um, that's that one. So the next one is a consistency proof. Um, this one allows us to check whether a registrar or authority has rewritten history. So if they issue, if uh, an inspector of a restaurant issues a new, new report for a restaurant, they want to know that the history of this register is still as it was, the history hasn't been rewritten um, and the registrar, the registrar is not going back on their word. Um, on the list of properties of the register earlier, one of them was the, that a register is append only, um, so you never ever, even if you update a record, it's always appended, you never lose that. This proof allows you to verify that property of the register. And finally, we have what is called the register proof. So this would allow you to download the entire register, store it somewhere else, take it away, do something, use it. Um, but you could then later prove to someone else that its entire contents is a genuine register and it's not been tampered with since you've had it. So how are we going to provide these proofs? Um, we plan to use something called a Merkle tree. It looks a bit like this. Um, it's a cryptographic concept um, which allows us to verify these three properties that I just mentioned 
quite efficient, well, very efficiently and securely. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute. But I'm going to mention a project by Google called Certificate Transparency, who we are working with using a lot of their ideas. This, um, they are using Merkle trees at the moment in something that they've called a verifiable log. Um, so a certificate transparency, what is this? Uh, this? The aim of the certificate transparency project for Google is to fix some of the flaws in the SSL certificate system, uh, so the cryptographic system that underlies all of the HTTPS uh, connections. So how are they going to do this? Well, they, um, they've got what they call a verifiable log, so it's a list of all issued uh, SSL certificates. It makes it possible to identify any certificates that have been mistakenly issued by a certificate authority or maliciously acquired. So, for example, if you were Google, you could look up um, the list of authorities that have issued certificates for Gmail, for example, or us as the um, as GDS, we could check the um, certificates issued for uh, the country register. So although we're not actually storing certificates in our, um, in our registers, there's quite a lot of um, ideas around transparency that certificate transparency pro project um, we can kind of borrow and steal. Um, so now I'm going to explain what um, certificate transparency concept of a verifiable log, which we are borrowing, how that works. So um, suppose that we're building a register of restaurant inspections. Um, first, we collect some data. We've got five entries here in that register of inspections for diff five different cafes. Um, we then compute the secure hashes for each of these individual entries. You've got here A, B, C, D, and E. Um, we then combine these into a Merkle tree. So G is a hash of the concatenation of A and B, uh, H is a hash of C and D, and you go up all the way up to M, which is the Merkle root hash. Um, so this root hash signature here, this M, um, that is actually the register proof that I mentioned just a minute ago. If you were to download this whole register, and later want to prove that it's genuine, all you'd have to do is take your individual raw entries and rebuild this root hash and prove that they're the same thing, and that is your registered proof. Um, as entries are added, added to the um, log, the, uh, to the register, the log grows, so it's equal in size to the size of the register. Um, now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about how um, audit and consistency proofs actually work because it's a bit of a rabbit hole. If you want to go into lots of detail into that, there's a, a link down the bottom to a blog uh, uh, that will give you more information. Um, there's one thing I'm going to mention though about the verifiable log. It's the structure of the verifiable log is special in that it allows you to do an audit proof or a um, consistency proof without downloading the whole register, which could be huge. So, for example, if we're looking at just one, one entry, the last entry, Roy's Rolls, all, all you need is uh, to verify that this is an entry in the register is you just need to know the value of K, which covers the whole, which you need to know all um, siblings as you go from the path from the uh, entry in the register to the top of the Merkle root hash, and for this case, that's just K. And for an audit proof, so if we've got the original tree here and we add one more entry, so F, uh, prima donna there, so F is the new hash of the new entry, all you need to prove that uh, this tree and the previous tree are consistent is that you need to prove that um, the first five entries in this tree are exactly the same as the first five entries in the previous tree. To do that, you just need to know the value of K and E, because K and D cover the whole of the first tree, and they cover the first five entries in the second tree. There is more detail than that. If you want to see it, go to that um, link there. I'm going to mention one further proof that we might consider implementing. This is something, a verifiable log, that 
comes from certificate transparency can't give us. This proof is a record proof, so is the data I have fresh? The audit proof I mentioned earlier, so if we go back to the example of the food hygiene rating in my local restaurant, um, the audit proof is useful, but being able to prove that this is a genuine entry in the register is not useful if there is a more recent version where this entry has been downgraded from five star to one star. So the record proof verifies that this is the most recent up-to-date entry and there hasn't been a later inspection that's changed that. But as I say, the verifiable log can't give us that information. So if we're going to implement the record proof, how do we think we might do it? Well, there is another implementation of a Merkle tree um, called, from certificate transparency again, this is called a verifiable map rather than a verifiable log. It's um, similar in that it's both, again, another Merkle tree. However, this Merkle tree, rather than growing in size with the size of the register, it's a constant size and it's absolutely huge. If you have a hash in algorithm of say SHA-256 so that your, um, your, hash, your unique hash is always 256 bits long, then the size of your tree is two to the power of 256. So it's like unconceivably big. Um, but the thing that makes it really efficient is that because your um, entries are in leaf positions addressed by that hash, most of them are empty values and it's really sparse. So that's what makes creating, calculating a record proof, proving that you've got the latest entry really efficient in a verifiable map. And this is where I ask for some feedback. Um, we want to know if you can think of any times where you've checked this kind of integrity of your data, or can you think of times when you'd wanted to be able to check the integrity of your data but you've not been able to? Um, would you like to be able to check that you, can, you have the latest entry or that you, this is genuinely an entry or that history hasn't been rewritten in an append-only log of data? Um, please let us know what you think. Um, you can provide any feedback generally at um, this uh, beta banner at the top there, the feedback banner, or please come find us later after the drinks or on Twitter. You can hunt us down. Thank you very much. Got time for questions? Um, this is all great, fantastic idea. Um, one registry I'm dealing with is the um, WHO listed clinical trial registers, and it's compiled from, you know, kind of one from every group of countries. I wonder if you have any plans for collaborating, where you've got a few people, a few organisations putting stuff into a single register, or allowing your register to interoperate with something comparable. Is this only something that can work as a self-contained, ordered by a single person? Shall I take this yeah. one? Um, so, uh, I think, I mean, the, the, the main answer is I don't know. Um, the models we've been working with have been around, uh, so we work in central government where there often is a single identifiable authority and we, uh, I mean, while I recognise the problem you're dealing with, it's not one we've had to look at yet. Um, I mean, other than the fact that uh, um, we, we, we wouldn't publish the register with the intervening uh, entry there, and um, I think that's the main way we're dealing with it at the moment. So but your update time serves to control that, basically, the sort of time step of the entry? I think um, a lot of this is still in flux. We're still evolving and iterating our model, and that is a very interesting question that we need to think about.
Yes. Um, so I think the, the most interesting answer I've got to you there is if I go way back uh, um, in the slides. It stopped responding again. So the, the, the name of this record you can see is, is GM and that is the ISO country code. So we're using standards to to deal with that. Um, there are issues with that, which I can talk to you about afterwards, but uh, um, where there are ex existing data standards, we want to use them. I mean, yeah, so the country field in this is GM, is the ICO country code. I certainly hope that that sort of analysis would be possible, and ideally without us having to even be involved. If, as long as we've published the data, then anyone can take it. And, uh, Are you um, thinking of providing any developer tools for that? So for me, I mean, this would be fantastic to clean up some data, but what I need is aliases. So kind of for Germany, I also want Deutschland, so I can map, map over. And also, I'd, I'd love to have like the open refine API, the free base um, so I'm, I'm not aware of the Open Refine API, so okay. um, maybe, maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Um, so, at the moment, the model we're working with is that all registers will be flat mappings of fields to values, and if there is any hierarchy, it will be through uh, a link, um, as Michaela was talking about, from one register to another register. I mean, I think what we're going for here is, is, is definitely a lower bar than the full linked data thing. We're not looking to link to arbitrary data out on the internet. The, where these registers link, they're only to other registers within the UK government. Um, so I think that's the main difference. Um, uh, I, would, I would add to that. I'm, um, I'm sure other people are more expert in linked data than I am and can, can do an interesting analysis. Well, that said, we do make the data available as turtle if people want to use it that way. Um, I think that's all the time we've got for questions. But thank you very much. <laughs>